which makes it very, very hard to have a centralized security program. Anybody who's worked in the banking arena for long knows what I'm talking about. The next big thing, which is quite a you know, annoying thing about this industry is that development is often outsourced. The unfortunate thing is labor is cheap and developers are even cheaper. Um, you can get a room for the developers for $4 a day. So, and banks are using this. So what they're doing is they're outsourcing all the development to certain countries up there in the map of the world, and you get a thousand people all coding your application. The problem is, what we've experienced at Corsair, is the majority of time, these developers do not have industry experience. We've expected that these developers are brought in as an industry stopgap. They finish you know, university, they've maybe got their software engineering degree, and now they're put onto a development site and say, right, let's build an internet bank, which is where the problems start happening. And the other big beef is security consultancies are not discovering the vulnerabilities. I'm not talking about your basic SQL injection and cross-site scripting. To be honest, I don't expect those bugs to exist today. I have no reason why they should exist, but they still do. So the agenda, what we're going to talk about today, um, this is not going to be a, a heavy, in-depth technical talk. Um, I expect people here don't want to hear that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm still quite jet-lagged, so you're not going to get too techy. We're going to be looking at authentication, authorization, mathematical operations. Uh, I can see a, bit of, a few people getting worried here. Validation routines, and then logging and attack detection. I'm going to touch on a few topics there and then talk to you about the things that we've seen over the past four years, assessing applications, and hopefully give everybody else an idea of what they need to start looking at when it comes to testing applications. So the first stage that any tester has to do is look at the application. And this is probably one of the fundamental things that a lot of testers aren't doing. If you're jet lagged like me and you can't sleep, here's some amazing bedtime stories. Because these are really boring. You will fall asleep. But there is a reason why these exist. And if you are testing financial applications, you should kind of know some of these. In the UK and Europe, you've got the Financial Services Authority. They are guaranteed to strike fear in any bank. So kind of know, their, you know what they want, what they expect from the application. You've got in the US sarbanes Octa, you've got the Data Protection Act. UK government has a problem with Data Protection Act. They keep on losing loads of people's data. They don't really care. They've made the law. And then you've got the new cash cow, which is the PCI standard. Uh, the other standards, which are also quite useful for a tester to understand, are listed there, special 17799. Quite a useful standard to know. So the first stage before anybody comes in and looks at an application is gathering information. Subtle vulnerabilities are often going unnoticed. Um, what I'm going to do during this talk is give little snippets of stuff I've learned in the past four years. I'm not going to name any names. Uh, you don't have to throw any balls at me. But um, one example, a very large security research team spent three days reverse engineering the encryption code, which was proved to be insecure, but they just decided they had to write a Java GUI to do so. So it was going after the meat and you know, potato type vulnerabilities and ignoring the fact that you could bypass authentication, you could do log file injection. So it's this, there's still this ego in the security industry where you have to go over the biggest and the baddest vulnerability. Not always the case. Um, the knowledge gaps between security testing teams and the business is also a key problem. How many people have gone into a security testing you know, phase and said to the business, right, I'd like all the functional spec, I want you to give me a developer so I can sit down for half a day and understand the application, and by the way, I want all the contact points for this application. How many people here do that on a regular basis? Wow, not many. Okay. So there's obviously an issue there. That's one of the stages that is being overlooked. And as I said before, security testers are overlooking the basic stuff. Um, there's this big thing, I've got to find SQL injection, I've got to drop a table here and there. When really small vulnerabilities, which might seem small to you, like obtaining one cent on every transaction, you know, from doing a currency conversion, that's not that big. But to a bank, when you've got thousands and thousands of transactions happening a day, it is a big thing. So these are just some of the things that are being missed. Um, business logic. I really do expect any security tester to understand the application's functions and security requirements. If you do not understand this, you've just failed. Go home. Um, you've got to understand what the application does. What functionality is expected? What shouldn't happen? How is this application actually supposed to work? You know, because without you understanding this, how are you going to test this application? For every case that you accept as a tester, there should be an abuse case. So the application is for transferring funds between your normal account and your Cayman Islands account. What happens if you don't have any money in your normal account? You have to start building up use and abuse cases. Um, some of the examples there is, how can an attacker subvert this function? Whenever you're looking at financial applications, that has to be in the back of your mind. How can somebody do something bad to this application? Um, 
How many, what's the maximum amounts that can be done? In certain Middle Eastern countries, there are limits to how much money you can transfer between accounts, such as Pakistan and India. They have hard-coded limits. If you go past that, you're breaking government legislation. Does the application let you do this? Um, can the amount be a negative value? So these are all the questions that you should be asking yourself when you're doing a test. By the way, um, rather than ask questions at the end, if you want to just ask questions while I'm going along, it's a lot easier, so just put your hand up or throw money at me. So any questions on that? No? Okay, good. The next stage I'm going to be looking at is authentication. Um, I'm not going to be looking at your standard testing stuff or bypass the, bypassing authentication. I'm going to be looking at some of the areas that we've seen in banking today. Um, there are a few sites that are still using single factor authentication, uh, which I think for a banking application is pretty poor. Um, I've never heard of a broke bank, well, maybe Lehman Brothers, but that was another story. Um, they should all be using more secure authentication methods. The ones that are using single factor authentication, there is an increased th threat from phishing and uh, password guessing attempts. And, you know, amazingly, these banks are still attacked and done this way. There are also poor controls about password choice and the management regarding that password choice. Believe it or not, you can still choose weak passwords in some banks around the world, which is quite shocking in 2008, are we? So, you know, that kind of thing still has to be looked at. Um, the one thing that was in the news a couple of weeks ago was one of your vice whatevers. Um, her account was done recently from the password uh, account retrieval process. You'll be uh, surprised how many times this actually happens with banking applications. A lot of banking apps still use the standard thing of what is your birth date? Where were you born? That kind of stuff. This information is quite easily gleaned from the internet. I think everybody these days has a Facebook account. That kind of information is out there. The other function that we've seen that is often not checked is the account lockout process. So what some banks do is, and we've said in the industry before, if you're brute forcing an account, lock the account after three password retries or three failed attempts, which is all very well and cool. But what happens if you've got 100,000 banking customers and you run against a large word list? You then lock out half your internet banking, which causes a big nightmare for 55,000 developers in India who've then got to manually unlock it. Because rarely have I seen an automated tool to unlock all the accounts. It's all a manual process. Shared secrets are an area that has popped up more often. Um, so we have the single factor authentication, and then we have areas where you get asked a question that you've already given an answer for. Some of the issues that we've had problems with is that the questions often asked are quite basic. Um, I was testing a banking app last week, and you were given three questions. And the questions are, what's your favorite football team? What's your favorite color? And I think the last one was, where was you born? Uh, and, you know, so it's questions like this, which are quite basic and rudimentary allow a user to start testing, you know, putting in their own secret questions and you'll, you know, get around this type of attack. Um, so that. Going on to two-factor authentication. Am I talking too fast? No? Okay. Two-factor two authentication tests. Um, one firm that we did notice didn't know how to actually test two-factor authentication, which was a bit interesting. They were testing a banking application at the time. Um, you need to start looking for that the application adequately prevents brute force attacks against the authentication tokens. Um, a lot of the times you're using third party mechanisms for two factor authentication, and these are actually quite easily tested. Always ensure that the same challenge is generated if you fail the first one. You'd be amazed how many times we've seen applications where it gives you the secret challenge question, and you say, right, well, this is it. So it's all right, well, here's another one to try. Always keep on using that same one, but testers aren't doing this. And also, again, test for the potential of denial of service. It is a real bugbear when you can lock out half of your internet banking accounts. Sorry. Yep. Um, because if you failed that first question, so what is your cat's name, John, don't give them a new one. Make them re-answer that question until they get it right. Um, a lot of times it's overlooked. So don't, you know, don't go out from the pool. Don't say, right, you've got 10 questions. You failed the first one. Well, I'll give you the second one instead and go that way. It's very easy to brute force that. Um, one of the things that um, I know was talked about earlier was cross-site request forgery. Um, it's a bit boring, to be honest. Um, it's quite easily resolved. And um, what a lot of banking applications are doing now is transaction pins. So when you, you log into your normal application and you get, you want to transfer money into my account, um, you get, as soon as you do that click, you know, transfer, you get issued with a transaction pin. The benefit of doing it with this is that it does knock out most excess RF, whatever they're called at this month, things. The other option is, a lot of the times, if they do it over a get thing, it's pretty much game over. If they do it over a post thing, even better. But testers aren't testing for this. There are actually ways to get around this transaction pin. 
Um, a lot of the time, users are allowed to just pick their own transaction password. So again, it comes into the fact that they will choose very weak password things. A lot of the banks we've seen don't actually have a password policy that stops this transaction pin from being insecure. So they'll check the user's password against the IT security policy, but they'll forget about the transaction pin. So a lot of the times it's one to eight or one to nine, et cetera. These areas are not being looked at. That's pretty much for authentication. Um, all the other basic tests do apply, but these are the main areas that we've seen haven't been tested. Um, we tested the past two years, um, probably about 60 to 70 major banks at the moment. And we actually have put research on the Corsair website to detail how many vulnerabilities we're finding. And I'm not just you know, saying stuff out here. We actually are finding a lot of consultancies not finding these bugs. We're finding quite complex bank applications being given the green light to go ahead on the internet. And when we're doing the retest, we're finding six vulnerabilities. So there is you know, a method behind my madness. Next section we're going to be looking at is authorization. Okay. There's two classes of authorization that should be considered before testing. With most banking applications, you have different users. You have different levels of users. How the developers decided to work out how that authorization is going to happen varies between different de development teams. I've not really seen an approach that works you know, on a global basis yet. Everyone has its pros and merits, etc. So the first level is user level authorization. So can I see other users' bank accounts? That's pretty much fundamental in any banking application. You don't want to see somebody else's thing. A lot of the times, the checks we found we were doing was a simple hidden form in an HTML field. That's how they were doing authorization. So start checking for this. Start tampering around with the account IDs. Start seeing if you can enumerate other usernames, you know, other account IDs. So in the post request, modify the account there and put another one in. Does it give you a different error? Start playing around with that. This is not being tested. The next level is role level authorization. Um, a few banking apps actually allow you to log in as a former you know, administrative privilege. And a lot of the times they will do this on a flag basis. One simple flag you know, is administrator, yes. Okay, that's quite a basic example. But that's the gist of things. And again, these are things that are being totally missed. The ability to log in and start adding yourself direct debits or credit, et cetera, itself. So the test that I expect testers look for is access control is performed in the entire transaction and just not on the start page. You'd be amazed how many applications do this. And you can't bypass the transaction authentication by just simply removing it. Um, this is also a common tactic. It's quite easy. A lot of applications will quite happily work if you just remove the token itself. So very brief section on authorization. Um, I expect there's not much that you know, hasn't been covered. The section that we have found the most vulnerabilities in and the area that I find the most interesting for banking and applications is mathematical operations. Uh, how many people here did read the Corsair paper on numerical vulnerabilities that was released? So quite a few of you. Um, there was a bit of a, you know, interesting backlash regarding the paper. A uh, few people said that, you know, the paper didn't really give us anything new. It was kind of a known thing. And my question is, if it was such a known thing within this industry, why are banking applications and most applications still vulnerable to these type of attacks in 2008? And why aren't testers actually testing for this kind of stuff? So the first set of tests that we, we start to look at is the currency manipulation tests. I mean, everybody here who's used their online banking obviously can transfer money out and get currency, etc. What we've noticed is that these types of applications are quite vulnerable to tampering with the parameters. Um, so the currency can only be manipulated within the parameters permitted. Another example is between Middle Eastern banks, so Pakistan and India. Um, there are restrictions on where you can and cannot transfer between different currencies. A lot of the times they do this on the UI itself. They're not doing the checks to see, actually, hang on a minute, can I transfer to US dollars from Pakistan? Is that allowed? These checks aren't being picked up. Um, another function is manipulating the currency yourself. It is quite handy when you want to transfer into another currency and you can decide what kind of value the currency is. Um, the currency displayed, hello, okay. Um, the currency displayed is actually the same as the approver. A lot of the times when, in more complex banking applications, when you click the option to transfer currency, it doesn't happen automatically. It will go to an approver within the bank. There are ways where you can start manipulating that to show the banking approver, look, I actually want to transfer into dollars, but in reality, I want more Pakistan rupees or whatever else it is. 
And also, again, how much can you limit on a, an account? If you only want $20,000 coming out per day as a hard-coded limit, can you bypass this amount using various mathematical ways to do that? So the, the, the tests that we expect to see and that we do at Corsair is manipulation of source and destination account numbers. You'd be amazed at how many times you've actually been able to get other people's banking details using this very, very simple method. It sounds quite absurd in 2008 that you, know, you can still log into an application and get this, but it does happen. Enumeration of account numbers. A lot of the times when you put in a different account number, you can start to work out what are valid account numbers and what aren't. This is a great way to then start using this as a further method of attack. And transferring money between legitimate accounts using negative values. A lot of the times, developers don't expect you to put in a negative value for a currency. Because why would you? But a lot of the times, it could also crash the application, cause various errors, and also get you where you want to get. Um, the next part of the mathematical thing is actually bypassing validation routines. Um, in this day and age, I have to admit, a lot of applications and developers kind of understand the need for a centralized validation engine. Um, the days of finding cross-site scripting and SQL injection in the more complex applications doesn't really exist. Um, they, ha they are quite clued up on coming in, checking inputs, you know, against, you know, et cetera, bad list or white list, and then going from there. But there actually are ways for testers to go around and get past validation routines. First one is exponential notation. Is anybody here familiar or use these techniques yet? Three, four, so it's quite handy. This is actually perfect for a tester when testing an application. Um, the price of BEM says is I have a banking application and it will only let me transfer 1,000 US dollars a day. Um, what a lot of the times I would do personally is instead of having more than 1,000, I would put 110 E plus one, which is obviously quite a lot of zeros. And then we'll see if the application will let me go that through. Often in this case, it will happen. Um, a neat little trick that we found out yesterday with my colleague Adam over there is that 9E minus 1 is actually 0. Now, what are the times when you're transferring money, you can't have a 0 balance? And the application will actually check to see if that balance is 0. If you put 9E minus 1, you've effectively bypassed that validation routine. And then, obviously, depending on the error or bypassing, you can go from there. Um, in the paper that Adam and everybody else created, there was a section on API abuse. And within Java and C Sharp, there are a whole lot of reserved string words, which can be quite useful to penetration testers out there. Um, these can be used to bypass validation routines and also cause serious data corruption issues. Um, one of the premises for having a bank banking application is that the FSA and other regulatory environments require the data to be quite secure. So if you're able to crash it and cause data corruption issues, you're actually breaking a lot of the banking standards. So these reserve values that you can use are NAN, infinity, minus NAN, and minus infinity. Um, a couple of months ago, Adam actually found a vulnerability on a well-known bank's um, currency application, is that when you logged into the application and it, you grabbed your um, bank balance, you could modify the outgoing balance. So in turn, he put in infinity and it actually came back as the infinity symbol. So these are quite useful words for any test to do, and a lot of people actually aren't using these. The next section um, I'm going to talk about is rounding errors. Um, this is actually not illegal in a lot of banking applications, but it's some areas where you can actually start making money from your bank itself. Um, I don't obviously advise you to do that because getting arrested and having a court case is a bit annoying, uh, but it's definitely something that you should do when you're doing a testing. So applications often have to express values with a fixed number of decimal places. So exactly, you know, um, large currencies such as the dollar or everything else. You'd use this when you're doing your currency conversion. The round to nearest and ties away from zero is probably the most commonly applied method. And what's good about these two methods is that they're very, very good to abuse. So the most common scenario where these happen is where the currency conversion and the um, rounding of some sort cannot be avoided. The exchange rate between two currencies, um, et cetera, places like that. So if we look at we look at an, exact, uh, an example here. We want to convert money between a euro and a pound. So the exchange rate is 0 0.745. So if you do that in a normal currency thing, that would round up to 75. Obviously, 4 is closer to 5 in the convention. It rounds it up. So 1 euro times 0 0.745 is equal to 75p. If you do this a 1,000 times, you get 750 pounds. 
which is a lot more than you should do, it's 12 pounds. If you then, then take it back to so 750 pounds into euros, you're getting 1,006 euros. You're actually making six euros and 71 cents per transaction. So you're taking money from the bank. But this doesn't always work that way. The bank actually also takes money from you without you knowing this. So this is an area where testers aren't actually looking for with the currency band of things. It's quite a cool way to you know, make money from your bank or watch out if your bank's actually taking money from you. Just another thing to consider. Uh, and the last section that we're going to talk about, so it's a bit of a whirlwind talk, is logging and attack detection. Um, a lot of the banking requirements require that a lot of information is logged for the banking application itself. And it's these logging mechanisms where you can actually start playing around with. The idea that every tester needs to understand is what is the business requirement of what should be logged. So that's your first thing when you're testing an application. The application needs to distinguish between normal application use and errors caused by malicious intent. And then the next thing is attack, attack logging requirements should also be used as criteria for generating alerts. So when we have a normal ba banking application, I expect the application to start picking up on when somebody's running a full-blown tool against the front end of the app. I expect them to pick up when I've tried to transfer money to an account that I don't have access to. This is the basic kind of thing. What I don't expect is that when I'm looking at a banking application, I can start doing stuff like log file injection against the application page itself. Now, I, obviously I know the FSA requirements more than the US requirements, but what the FSA stipulates is that information needs to be stored in a log file in a secure manner. The nice thing about a lot of the applications we've tested, I think only one has not been vulnerable to log file injection, is that we've been able to wipe out any record of our attack when using currency rounding errors, et cetera, itself, just using standard basic log file injection. And a lot of the times, the developers didn't understand this was happening. They didn't have a concept of, right, hang on, you're writing to the log file, what's the problem there? Because a lot of the times, they would set the log file to be only five megs long, and then create a new log file. And after every 10 log files, delete that first log file. So it was very, very easy to script it all to say, right, I'm now going to see if I can start stealing money from the bank. What I'm going to do at the same time, I'm going to start doing log file injection errors. And by the way, I'm going to wipe out all your logging. So they never knew what was, hit, you know, what was hitting them, which is also quite a real thing. Um, the areas where I expect you know, logging to happen, as I said, tampering with any parameters, deliberate attempts to view unauthorized accounts, um, your common web application tech, so your tamp tampering, cross-site scripting, the X and the name they've given it this week, and everything like that. And then what I expect the locking mechanism to do is properly encode itself to prevent attacks through the log themselves. One of the cool things that we were talking about doing the other day, banking applications out there use Oracle Forms to view you know, and build up the banking things. And the log files there are exported using CSV. So it'd be quite cool if you knew this to create a log file injection where you could actually start breaking around with the Excel spreadsheet viewer that the, app, you know, the application developer is going to start using. So these are the things that the developers not, you know, need to start understanding that log file injection attacks are actually quite out there and people need to start protecting. So, sorry if this is a bit of a whirlwind talk. The, the basis of this talk was that I think that a lot of security consultancies out there need to start looking at doing a more methodical approach to testing applications. Um, there was a lot of emphasis over the past couple of years over the more hyped up attacks out there. I'm not gonna name names, but there has been a few. And we are seeing you know, more and more applications being passed as secure, when in reality they're not. And these are not from companies that I'd expect to miss these basic bugs, but they are. Um, you know, it, it is happening. I mean, we can see it here. There's a lot more people coming to the OWASP stuff. The OWASP testing guide has grown into quite a well-known document. More and more people are quite clued up on testing methodologies. It wasn't like this six years ago. We would have people coming in and looking at application security and just doing a scatter type approach. So it is actually changing. Um, the tools that I recommend everybody use is pretty much a brain. Um, there's no one tool to do everything. Um, you know, it's I think with any application, you really need to understand the application you're testing. You need to know it inside and out. And that does make us different from attackers. Attackers only really have one method, is get in no matter how they can. As security testers, you don't really have that luxury. You have five days on site. You have all the documentation if you need it. And if you want to, you have all the developers there. So people need to start actually interacting with these different teams. You know, that whole days of long black hair and black clothes and just sitting in the corner, those days were pretty much dead. So it's you know, time to move on and grow up. Um, we have actually got a, quite a few papers on the Corsa website. 
Uh, the two I would recommend the most was Breaking the Bank, Vulnerabilities and Numeric Processing within Financial Applications, and uh, Security Testing Applications through Automated Software Tests. Uh, they do go into a lot more technical detail about the, the concepts I've touched on today, and they're actually well worth reading, especially if you are looking at applications. And um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Any questions? New questions. Cool. All right. Thanks very much.